Hello and welcome to Monterey Bay Academy's online streaming. My name is Daniel Gregory and I'm the worship and media pastor here at the church. Now if you're new to who we are, we welcome you. We're a youth-centric church based around, by, and for the students and faculty of Monterey Bay Academy. We have a proud heritage of serving our local community and our neighboring area. So, on behalf of our senior pastor, Tom Garner, and our principal, Jeff Deming, we hope you enjoy your time with us and come to visit us often. Feel free to stop in and visit when you're in the area. We'd love to have you. God bless.
So, two men going through the big city. Let's say it was New York City. Walking through there, hustle and bustle, the sounds, the lights, the cars, the traffic, the yelling, the talking, the singing, the crying, the screaming, the whatever. Big city noise, big city everything. They're walking down the, uh, the sidewalk. Two friends. One of them says, oh, I heard a cricket. Other one looks at him. Quizzical look. Cricket. Keep walking. Oh, I hear the cricket again. How can you say you can hear a cricket? I can hear it, I tell you. Oh, are you sure? Yes, I can hear it. All right. So they both go walking. But now in search of the cricket, which the man once again said, oh, I hear it again. So he goes walking. Uh, goes to, uh, by the sidewalk where there's a tree, there's some bushes there. He goes through, opens the bushes a little bit, searches through, and picks up and said, oh, there's, see, cricket. It's like, how could you hear that in the midst of all this hustle and bustle and noise of the city? He says, you must have super hearing, much better than all of us. Uh, the regular, all of us, you must be some sort of super person. No, I have the same hearing as, as you. It's just that my ears are tuned to this. Like, what do you mean? Well, that's more than any of us know. Everyone, anyone can do that. What do you mean? Let me sh demonstrate. So, puts a cricket down. Pushes. And they keep walking. And he says, here, let me show you. Let me demonstrate. So he takes out of his pocket some change. And as they're walking, he um, just kind of casually, discreetly, drops some change on the, uh, drops a change on the sidewalk. And won't, wouldn't you know it? Like all the people within 20 feet of them turned around and looked and looked when they heard the chink 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 of the change hit the ground you see my friend said the man um, our ears will listen to what they're tuned into listening to so I hope today on this happy Sabbath you'll be tuned in to whatever message God wants you to hear starting from probably Sabbath school to today to the whole rest of the day so welcome to uh, church, and I hope you'll have a very nice time. There's a couple announcements um, that I'll make. One of them is at 3 p.m., Jonathan Felix over there in Senior Circle, 3 o'clock. We'll have a Bible study group, so make sure you uh, remember about that. 3 o'clock, Senior Circle. It's over there. Senior Circle. Uh, Bible study. Also, um, we have our speaker today is Pastor Gary Ford. Right there. Uh, he'll be speaking on uh, being prepared for the final crisis. Maybe in school, finals are your crisis, or you have other things that are worrying you. Well, what lessons can you take? If you need to, if you want, I find it fascinating. Anyone who wants, there's actually outline of what he's going to say. Um, copies of this paper in the back of church. So if you want to take a look, get some of those notes afterwards, you hear something like, oh, that was really good. I don't need to remember where it's from. If I just write it down, you can go back and there's a few copies. So I'm not saying you're going to have to fight for them, but you may have to share if you, if a lot of people want copies. Uh, let's see other things going on. Well, uh, not well for our church community and even students, I guess, faculty and staff, Boys and girls, ladies, gentlemen, children, adults, everybody. Over at VHM Christian School, um, that's where I uh, help out every so often. Um, I, I teach there uh, and stuff. Uh, over at VHM Christian School, we are having a skate night. Tonight. Tonight. This night at 8 o'clock. I know for you kids, you sleep early so you can wake up early do your schoolwork and all that stuff and all that. But if you're able to be, uh, what are they called, night owls, awake from 8 to 10, there's a skate night at the VHM gym. If you've got nothing else going on, if for some miraculous reason there's nothing going on at school, you can bug your, your, uh, your dean, your assistant dean, bug your counselor, bug your pastor, bug your favorite teacher, bug your least favorite teacher. Well, you don't have those. Bug your teachers, principal, bug anyone you can to take you to VHM, Christian School, Skate Nights, uh, only $2 entrance. Who knows, you could ask that counselor, that uh, advisor, you could ask that teacher, can you loan me $2 so I can go and skate? And then they'll 
you can skate. So it'll be really fun if you're able to go. If not, we'll miss you, but understand. Uh, so if you can make it, that'd be awesome. If not, that's okay. That's okay, but make it. Tell them that you want to go. All right, so that's for the community. Also, um, evidently tomorrow there is a uh, community service day tomorrow, right? Of some sort, so make sure. Uh, yeah, what else will energize you than a skate night the night before? So you could go, or uh, I won't push it anymore, I know. Um, um, so there's a work bee for school, uh, for the church also as well, uh, tomorrow from what I understand. I think those are all the major announcements that I have, unless I missed any. Okay. Um, today, we will be having our, or right now, we'll be having our mission spotlight, giving more than tithe from our new uh, division, and this comes to us from Zimbabwe. So let's take a look up here, giving beyond tithe. Mr. and Mrs. Umpofu knew that their animals were meant for the Lord. One day, as the couple watched over their livestock, they felt inspired to do more for God. So they gave a portion of their animals as tithe and mission offerings. <laughs> What moved us as husband and wife to not just give our tithe, but also a bull as offering, is the current GC strategic plan of I Will Go. That challenged us very much because the Bible says, everything belongs to God, and we are just his stewards. We are following the scriptures that there is great blessings in giving, and that touched our hearts so much because the Lord has been so good to us. Out of the 31 animals they owned, they tithed three cows, and gave one bowl for the mission offerings. This gesture not only encouraged the visiting church elders who collected the animals, but it caught the attention of neighboring church members as well. Several others have pledged to contribute more to the mission offerings because of Mr. and Mrs. Mpofu's example. The mission offerings make a huge difference around the world and can make the greatest impact when given faithfully and regularly. Mr. and Mrs. Mpofu's country of Zimbabwe is home to Seleucia University. Founded in 1894, this Adventist institution educates students from all over Southern Africa. Zimbabwe is part of the Southern Africa Indian Ocean region. This territory is home to more than 4.3 million Adventists. Despite having a well-established history of church growth, there are still many mission struggles here. Your mission offerings help spread a message of hope in some of the most challenging areas like the growing cities. Please pray for the Southern Africa Indian Ocean region as church members there faithfully follow God's call in their lives. Even if you don't have livestock to give, thank you for supporting the mission offerings. All right, with that, um I think uh, I will invite the, or I would ask please, for those who are collecting offering to stand. And any uh, loose, bud, uh, loose offering today will go to our local church budget if you want to give an offering to a specific ministry, whether it's our, um, our mission or anywhere else, just write it on a tithe envelope and give that in. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning that you've given us. Thank you for this new day. Uh, please bless those who are able to give and bless those who are not able to give this time, but in the next time they'll be able to. Thank you for the love that you've given us and help us to give back kindness in return to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. <laughs>
if you have your Bibles, and if you don't have them, but if you have your Bibles, open them up to Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13 are the verses we'll be reading. If you don't have a Bible, hand, like you didn't bring your own personal Bible, there's one in the bench uh, in the pew in front of you. Uh, it may be right behind you. I believe it should be on the, um, it'll be eventually on the screen behind me. Those are the new, uh, excuse me, that's the, oh yeah, the new international version. I will be reading from the New King James Version, so that would be any discrepancies in uh, words. And uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, the whole armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil days and having done all, to stand. Let us bow our heads uh, for our prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you again, praising you, thanking you for this day, Lord. Thank you for waking, you, waking us up, and thank you that we have our speaker here today. Please bless him mightily that your Holy Spirit uh, will fill his heart and mind, that the words that are spoken are your words, Lord, to inspire us to be able to stand in these uh, evil times, Lord. Please uh, inspire us to make a change where there needs to be a change, to share what we need to share, Lord. Uh, bless us all here. Bless our families, our friends, those who know you. Bless those who don't know you as well, Lord. Guide us in our lives. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Our theme this month is over resurrection. So we've been talking about going home and coming home. And this, is, this month is on, on home, as in the home that Christ is preparing. So... The first and the fourth song, I'm going to ask you to, to stand for it, and you'll see why, because it's about standing, and, and which seems appropriate. So our first one is called Christ the Lord is Risen Today, um, and we will be doing it from, it's hymn number 166, and uh, we'll do this this week, and we will do it on Easter weekend, uh, where some of you will be gone. The interesting thing about Easter is it's the only holiday, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this is the only holiday that's actually going to exist in heaven. Let me explain that. Easter is the event that settled for the entire universe that God is Lord over all. We don't celebrate his birthday. We don't know the exact date of that. If God would have wanted us to know, he would have put it somewhere where we'd have it in record. December 25 is not it. But Easter has been so well documented that we literally know exactly when and where Every year, back 2,000, we've kept track of them. Because it's tied to the Jewish Passover festival, and it's tied for us. As Paul said, if Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain, and we of all people most miserable. So this one event, which changed the entire universe and settled, as Jesus said, it is finished, put the end to the war. We're still kind of wrapping up, so we start with Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens, thou earth reply. Christ hath opened. 
stand. All right, I could I can't stand while I'm playing. I invited you, but I can't stand while I'm playing. Um, and anyway, it just has to have brass. That just song just has to have an organ. But my hope is built is also on the message of Christ as the anchor. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. <laughs> built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darkness seems to veil his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound, no oh, may I then in him be found, within his righteousness alone call us to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. the first one, so I guess we'll just stand for the last two then. All right. So I'm invite you to stand for this one and the next one. This one you'll know. The next one we've done before, we've only done a couple times, but this one I want to do a little different because we all know this song. Lord, I lift your name on high, again, speaking of the resurrection, but we all know this song, so we're going to try it a little different than just a straightforward uh, tempo. Um, so, because I think it would be more interesting.
This one, we, we started a couple of, started a year by a group called Cain, and I just love the message about rise up like um, Lazarus, Jesus calls all of us from where we are.
Take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Your brand new power of death couldn't hold you. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? Rise up, rise up, rise up, out from the grave like Lazarus. Rise. Thank you for all those participating. Thank you. You may sit down. Good morning. There's more people here than that. Good morning. A few more stepped in. Good. He was about 20 years old. He was standing beside the road, had his thumb out. I don't normally recommend that people pick up hitchhikers. He had on jeans. His hair was past his shoulders. He looked neat and clean. He had on a uh, jacket dress jacket, and I pulled over. It was near Riverside City College, Riverside, California. He slid into my car and off we went. And as we drove down the road, I talked to him a little bit, asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm a student, Riverside City College. I said, oh, what are you taking? He mentioned microbiology and all kinds of subjects that led me to believe he was going to be a doctor because it was the, seemed like the pre-med courses that he should take. He went on telling me about the courses a little bit and then he turned to me and I asked him specifically, are you planning to be a doctor? And he turned to me and he said, I'm waiting for my parents to die. I'm not sure I heard him right and so I, I said, you're waiting for your parents to die? He said, yeah, you see, I normally don't stand by the road hitchhiking. That's something I don't do. I have a, and he named some brand new car that he had. He was having new mufflers put on it, big wheels and things put on it, and suspension system on it. He said, I'm getting it fixed up, so I had to hitchhike today and get a ride. He said, I'm a student over here, and I, I asked him questions. Are your parents sick? Did they have an accident? He said, oh, no, they're fine. Thank you very much. But you see, they've written into their will, and they're very wealthy, that unless I'm a part-time student at RCC studying medicine or pre-med, that I am to receive nothing from their will. I was flabbergasted a little bit. It was a different thought for me that he was waiting for his parents to die. His idea of fun was partying with his friends, and he went on about things, and all of a sudden he said, oh, this is my exit. We'd gone a couple exits on the freeway, so I took the exit, stopped, and he jumped out and said, thank you, and he was gone. That has stayed with me for a long time. I'm waiting for my parents to die. He wanted to do the bare minimum of what was required so that he might receive the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, because if he wasn't at least a part-time student, he would receive nothing from their will. You'd have to be dead to not know some of the events that have been going on around us in the world. The pandemic, when that first hit, a couple of years ago, I was coming back from Saudi Arabia and Egypt about a week or two before it broke and they shut down the borders. I came home a week early from Egypt because of some of the travel plans I was having trouble with. And then the pandemic hit, they closed down the churches, you had to wear the mask all the time and this and that. And the big phrase 
at that point in time is sheltering in place. And I thought, well, sheltering in place. And as they said that over and over again, I began to think, is that biblical? Did we miss some sign? And so I'm always interested in studying in Revelation, in the Bible, and different things. What signs are there to tell me about the end of time? Because people have been predicting Jesus is coming for years and years and years. And yet, is this something mentioned in the Bible? And as I began to read, I found it was in three different references at least sheltering in place is mentioned in the Bible. And so I've shared that with my church and I've talked to them. This is something that we've overlooked, but that's actually mentioned in the Bible. Three different prophecies talk about it, events and stories. So today I want to talk about preparing for the final crisis. Now I've preached in my, ser in my church all kinds of sermons about COVID and about the lockdowns and the restrictions and how it applies and how it touches on biblical prophecy and all those kinds of things. And then we've been talking about what's coming next. Well, we don't know what's coming next. But are we doing the bare minimum to just get by? Are we actually planning for that event to take place? How many of you here believe that Jesus is coming again? Do you believe that? Okay. Most of you believe Jesus is coming again. Preparation is a key word. What do we do to get ready so that we're ready for that event? Well, if it were, I guess it's about a month ago now that Putin decided to start a new war and to, in to invade Ukraine. And maybe some people saw that coming with him building up his troops. So today, as we talk about one of the stories in the Bible that talks about preparation, it's a story that you've probably heard before, but I want to go through it very carefully, looking at the details that God has built into that story. The Bible says in, it's a story of David Goliath, and you're probably familiar with that story. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 3, says the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. The name of that valley is the Valley of Elath. If you haven't been there, I want to take you there. I've been to the Valley of Elath. This is what it looks like. If you can see the picture, is kind of dark. But Israel's camp was on one side and the Philistines are camped on the other side. Israel was kind of camped in Saul's fortress up on the hill a little bit. In order to come down into that valley of Elah, David had to walk down. There's a certain area that you can walk down to get into that valley. And as you walk along in the valley, as he had to do to meet Goliath, there's a wadi there. The wadi is a little dry riverbed kind of thing, and it's still there today. But the Bible says a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Well, six cubits and a span. How tall was this guy? According to the Bible, according to measurement, a cubit is 18 inches. That means this guy was, depending on whether you use the royal cubit or you use the regular cubit, he was about 9 to 11 feet tall. Now, if you're 6 feet tall, as I am, and this platform is up about a foot, that means a couple feet above my head is about where Goliath. That means his legs, his arms, would be about the size of your leg. The Bible goes on describing this guy. It says he had on a bronze helmet on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and his weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, about 125 pounds. And it goes on. And then verse 41 says, an armor bearer went before him. And verse 7 says that. He had a little guy. The armor bearers are ones that stood beside the one that's actually doing the fighting. And they held extra weapons on their belt in case they broke a sword in battle, he could turn and grab another sword from his armor bearer, and the armor bearer held a spear, and he's standing there all prepared to assist Goliath as Goliath goes forth. According to the Bible, 
The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, about 125 pounds. Uh, the shield bearer went before him, verse 41, of course, and the people were greatly afraid. Um, every time Goliath comes out, he comes out once a, mo once a, a morning and evening, it says, um, once in the morning and once in the evening, and he bellows a charge out to them, come out and fight with me. And then all of the children of Israel, all of them were afraid. He comes out, and he does this morning and evening, and he bellows out his charge. And then everybody's greatly afraid, and they run off, and they hide behind the rocks. And this is going on for 40 days and 40 nights. And so the Bible says they were greatly afraid. He presented himself. He came forward. And then where's David in all this stuff? Well, David is back watching his father's sheep. He's not there on the battlefield. He's watching his father's sheep. He's taking care of them. And yet the Bible talks about his father comes to him and says, I want you to go to the battle. I want you to take these cheeses and these, these sandwiches and things. Take them over and check on the battle and see how your brothers are doing at the battle. So David goes, he gets up, he leaves, he goes, and he comes to the battlefield. The Bible says, David rose early in the morning, left his sheep with a keeper, took the things that went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the camp, and the army was going out to fight, and they're shouting for battle. You see, morning and evening, they're getting dressed up in their armor, and they're going out to fight. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, the army against the army. David leaves his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, and he runs to the army, and he came, and he greeted his brothers, and as he talked with them, there was this champion, the Philistine of Gath, that comes out, and he spoke the words according to the same words, and David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were dreadfully afraid, and this happens in front of David. They're dreadfully afraid. So, then David begins to ask questions. He's a little confused, and he says, what shall be done for the man that kills this Philistine? Who shall go up against him and takes away this reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The first thing you're going to have to know if you want to be ready for the second coming of Jesus, that God is alive and well in your life. He's your God, not your neighbor's God, not your roommate's God, not your teacher's God, but your God. Amen? He has to be the living God that you're aware of. David is aware of the living God. He's aware that God is alive and well in his own life. Now, he hasn't been out there dressed in armor. He hasn't been out there fighting. But he knows that God is alive and well. When the words of David spoke were heard, they were taken to Saul. And somebody told Saul what David was saying. Who's going to fight against this giant? Who's going to go out and fight against him? David spoke these words, and David, uh, Saul sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fear because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, if you picture that scene, David is escorted into Saul's tent. If you remember, Saul is a head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. And he's taken into the camp there, and he's in the tent of Saul. Now, picture Saul walking over to the tent flap, and he pulls the tent flap back from his tent, and he says, David, come here. And David's a boy. And he said, David, look out there. You see that guy out there in the battlefield? You see how big he is? You see the armor bearer standing beside him? He's been trained in warfare all his life. Hey, and look at you, David. You've got on your loincloth. You've got a staff in your hand. You're just a boy. You've been trained in this. You can't go fight against this guy. Saul is telling him how much he can't do this. And he goes all through this. He's a man of, you know, he's done this all his life. You can't do this kind of thing. Well, David spoke to the 
to Saul. And he begins to tell him about his faith. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And the lion or bear came out and the took a lamb out of the flock. I went out after it. I struck it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it arose, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing as it defied the armies of what God? The armies of the living God. David knew that God was alive and well. Do you know that God is alive and well in your life? Do you have that walk with God? Not because your teacher says you should have it. Not because your pastor Tom says this is what you should believe or follow. We don't know what's coming down the pike. First there was COVID, and that's been with us a couple years. Now we've got a war going on, and we're afraid, and NATO was afraid to get involved and send too much, too many aircraft or things like that. At least Russia pushed the nuclear button, and we end up with nuclear bombs going off. So everybody's wondering what's coming next. David believes in the living God. God is alive and well in his life. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David, his God, was alive and well in his life. That's the first thing. If you want to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus, you have to know that God's alive and well in your life. Not because someone tells you he's alive, but because you know that it's true. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, how could he say something different with this guy that's willing to step out in faith and fight against this giant that's out on the field? And then the Bible talks about Saul's faith not being as great as David's. And so it says, Saul clothed David with his own armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with his coat of mail. Saul is a head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. How could that work? How could that fit? David gets ready to go. He can barely walk with this stuff on. You know, I can't go with this stuff. He goes a few steps out towards Goliath. Saul is in the tent watching. All of his generals and lieutenants are standing there watching. As David struggles, he goes a couple steps out, and then he turns around to come back. And everybody says, ha, ha. And now he finally caught sight of that guy out on the field. And David takes this armor off, and he lays it at their feet. He says, I can't fight with this stuff. He's been leaning on the armor of God. How can he now lean on man's armor? Saul was bigger than everyone else. He can't wear this stuff. It doesn't even fit him. David fastened his sword to his armor. The Bible says when he tried to go, he had not tested them. And he says, I can't go with this stuff. So he took them off. Now, this is the wadi that David walked down in to pick up stones. I've been in that wadi, and I picked up five stones out of it, and I brought them today. I picked up five stones from that wadi. And the Bible says David picked up five stones. Some people ask why he picked up five stones. Well, the Bible, if you read further, says that Goliath had four brothers. David had five stones. So... As David walks out to meet Goliath, this is what it looks like, Wadi El Saint. So the Philistines came and drew near to David and began drawing near to David. The man who bore the shield went before him. A little guy, 41, verse 41, says the little guy is still standing there beside him. And the Philistine begins to curse David. I have to turn around and see. It's hard to see in the back. When the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was a youth, ruddy, and good-looking. 
The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with a sword or with a stick? David's got a staff there. Come here, little boy. Hit me with your stick, and we'll fight. We'll pretend to fight a little bit. So the Philistine says to him, and notice what David's answer is. Then David said to the Philistine, you come with a sword and a spear. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast. Why? So everybody knows that David is a great warrior? That's not what he says. That all the earth may know there's a God in Israel. You see, that's the second quality you're going to need to have if you want to be ready for the second coming of Jesus, and that's humility. You need to be willing to give the glory to God. God is able to deliver you out of anything you get yourself into. Goliath was a monster. But David says that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. He gives the glory to God. He tells him he's going to take his head off of him. This day, I'll do that. So giving God the glory is the second point. And then David goes beyond that now, and he opens it up to everybody that's there. Why? You remember that every time Goliath bellows out the charge, the men of Israel, they run and they hide in the rocks, the Bible says. And so David opens it up to all of them, and he says in verse 47, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. He's opened it up to everyone then. Sometimes people dress up and get ready to go to battle, but they don't fight. Morning and evening, twice a day, the Bible says, they dressed up in their battle array. They put on their helmets, they put on their coat of mail, they put on their boots, they got their spear, they got their javelin, and they stood there ready to fight, but they don't do any fighting because when Goliath bellows out, they turn around and run. That all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save with sword nor spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I love it. And then, so it was, the Bible says, David, so it was, the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, and David hurried and ran or hastened towards the army to meet the Philistine. I could picture the scene in my eye. Here comes Goliath, and the whole ground shakes as he moves forward, coming toward David. And David runs and hastens to meet him. He got the giant, and everybody thinks they know what's going to happen. Goliath is coming, and then David is gone because he steps on him, and he's finished. Doesn't work that way. That's not how the story ends. The Bible talks about David taking out a stone. Now, the slingshot that David used was not the why that you put a rubber band on and you pointed at someone and you let go of it. The slingshot was like this one. Long piece of leather. It's got a little bit bigger patch in the middle. And you put one end of it on your finger and you hold the other end on it and you put a smooth stone. It says he picked up five smooth stones. You put a smooth stone in it like this, and you swing it, and if you're not careful, the stone falls out. So you have to practice, and you have to know what you're doing. Goliath is bouncing along, coming at him, and David doesn't stand there, and it doesn't say he's swinging stones wildly, hoping that one of them hits this guy as he's bouncing down the road, coming at them. He takes a stone. He loads it, and as he's running, he begins to swing this thing. And the Bible says that he slung the stone, and it hit Goliath. Now, this is an ancient picture from the British Museum. 
about all of those Benjamites that could sling stones because they were all good at that and they could hit it according to the Bible within a hair's breadth. They were all good to be able to put the stone. It doesn't say that David was swinging it and if you've ever used one of these things, you let go of it and it has a whipping effect and it goes that way. You think, wow, I better let go of it back here because as it whips up front, I've got to hit the mark. Well, David had practiced what he was doing. David put his hand, took out a stone. Doesn't say he backed up, hoping that it would hit him. But David used his gifts and talents and his time wisely. If you want to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus, you have to develop the unique gifts and talents that God has given to you. Amen? What was David doing back when David was not in the battle? He wasn't playing video games in his room. He wasn't wasting his time. He was learning to play the harp. He was developing musical talents. He was also learning to use the slingshot and becoming very good at it, not so he could hope the Holy Spirit would take the rock from back there and swing it and hit the guy as he's bouncing forward, coming at David. It says David hastened and ran towards the guy. David is developing using his time and talents for God. If you want to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus, you may not be in the front of the battle, in the heat of the battle now. But I don't think there's any prophets among us. Nobody knows what's around the corner and coming next. And that means if you develop your gifts and talents, God will speak to you to use your gifts and talents for him if you're developing your gifts and talents. You see, the Bible says David could play well. When they talk about him playing for Saul, as it goes on talking about in the other chapter, David developed those gifts and talents while he was alone, while nobody was watching. Nobody was coming up to David and say, David, are you studying your Sabbath school lesson? Are you doing this and that? They're not, he wasn't doing that, but David was using his time wisely, preparing his gifts and talents to say, I want to use them for God. David hastened and ran towards the army. David took out a stone, and he hit Goliath. Now, it doesn't say that Goliath fell over dead right away, but remember, the man with the shield is still standing there. Goliath is stunned, and he falls over on his face there, and the armor bearer is still beside him, and that tells us the next thing about being prepared. The Bible says David hastened and ran and stood over Goliath, drew out Goliath's sword, and cut off the guy's head. The armor bearer is still standing there. He's in shock. The fourth thing that David did was train his ear to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit said, move, go, now's your time, David. David didn't sit there thinking, well, i got to pray about it, i got to think about it. But he learned to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere, maybe Isaiah 30, verse 21, thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, whether you turn to the right or turn to the left. You know what the Holy Spirit's voice sounds like as God guides you in your life? If you want to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus, you've got to train your ear to hear the Holy Spirit's voice. David was listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He ran and hastened and stood over the body. The armor bearer is still standing there. He takes Goliath's sword and cuts off Goliath's head. Your eyes, your ears will hear a word behind thee. I just quoted Isaiah for you. David walked all over Jerusalem and he was victorious, but there was no sword in the hand of David. He was victorious in that battle. Yes, I think the things at the end of time will get worse. Yes, there will be a lot to face, but I think God is able to take care of whatever we meet up against. 
if we listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's not convenient for us to do that. I remember coming home from evangelistic meetings when I was doing them in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. I had two churches, Honesdale and Scranton in Pennsylvania. And it's a 45 minute drive over back where I was living. And as I started out, it was late at night. It was 9 o'clock or 9.15 by the time I finished evangelistic meetings in Honesdale. And I had a 45-minute drive home. And as I started to drive home on that long road, 45-minute drive, I was already tired. It was already about 9.30. And the Holy Spirit said, Gary, you need to go see Mrs. Kemble. And I said, well, uh, it's just probably my overworked nature. Uh, you know, I'm always wanting to visit somebody. Mrs. Campbell didn't come to the meetings at Honesdale. She'd been coming, and she quit coming. And so I'm wrestling with God as I'm driving home and cruising along, and I'm kind of arguing with God. And finally, I throw the fleece out to God. Okay, God, if it's you that's telling me this, it's not just my overworked nature, I need to know that it's from you. So I threw the fleece out like Gideon did. I've been doing that all my life. So I said, okay, God, halfway home is this little town. And in the middle, I think it's Carbondale, you get to Carbondale and there's a yellow light in the middle of the town. There's not even a stoplight there. And it's a flashing yellow light. When I get to the flashing yellow light, Mrs. Campbell lives down that street. And I have to turn there. If it's you telling me and impressing me, go see Mrs. Campbell tonight, then slow me down when I get to that flashing yellow light. And I just whispered this prayer as I'm riding home and I'm buzzing along trying to get there as fast as I can because I want to get home. I'm tired. But the Holy Spirit said, go see Mrs. Campbell. Go see Mrs. Campbell. I said, okay, if I slow down, when I get to the flashing light, I'll know that you want me to turn and go see Mrs. Campbell. So I'm driving along and I pull up over the crest of the hill and I look way down there and the flashing yellow light is flashing and there's nobody around. And I think, man, I'm going to go buzzing right on through there. But you go a little closer to that light, and there's a tavern on the right. And an old truck pulls out of the tavern right in front of me. And then a car squishes in, in behind the truck, and I got to slam on my brakes and almost stop. And the light is there flashing at me. Gary, can you hear me? Gary, can you hear me? And I'm looking up at the light. I hear you, God. I hear you. Well, back then, we all didn't have cell phones or pagers that we carry with us. And so I thought, i got to stop and call her because it's about 9.30, quarter to 10 by now, and I can't show up at somebody's door. They'll be in their jammies. So I look around, and there's a vacant lot, a dirt lot right here by the light, and there's a phone booth. Why in the world would anybody put a phone booth on a dirt lot in the middle of nowhere? But it's there. I thought, okay, I'll stop and I'll call. So I pull my car over in this vacant lot where I've got to turn. Her house is just down the street a little bit. And I pull it, and I reach in my pocket, and I pull out all my change, and all I have is a quarter. And the phone call back then is a dime at this pay phone, and I'm flipping this quarter thinking, I don't want to waste my quarter on a dime call. And so I'm flipping the coin thinking about this, and I look down the street, about 200 feet down the street, is Dairy Queen. And it's open, and there's a line in front of them. And I say, God, really, I'm going to go, but i got to go get changed. I don't want to waste my quarter. So I jump in my car, and I run down the road, and I get to Dairy Queen, and I get out, and I get in line, and I'm flipping my quarter, and I'm thinking about it, and there's an old man. He's about 80 years old. He's in line, and there's somebody else, and there's a young girl in front of me, and I'm standing there waiting to get changed. And somebody gets done. The old man gets done, and we move up one. And the little girl turns around. She could have been 14. She could have been 16. I don't remember. She turned around. She said, hi, Pastor Ford. I'm Mrs. Campbell's daughter. When are you going to go see my mom? I'm going right now. I put my quarter away. I jumped in my car and I raced over to see her. She said, she's waiting for you. This girl is standing in line where I'm at. So I run over and I see Mrs. Campbell. And I find out why she didn't come to the meetings that night. Why she missed the last couple of meetings. She has cancer. And she's going into chemotherapy and she's about to die. That night, she gave her heart to Jesus for the first time when I made an appeal to her. God directed me to be there at that point. She died a couple weeks later. 
If you listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and train your ear to hear, sometimes it may not be convenient for you to do it at that point. But if you want to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus, if you want to be in the right place at the right time, and you want to be guided. Now, I've read articles in Time magazine where some people build concrete bunkers, and they say, when all these things take place, I'm going to hide in the concrete bunker. You read in Revelation where it talks about those balls of ice coming down from heaven. Those are 90-pound balls of ice. That's 21 inches in diameter hurled from God coming down and hitting the earth. Being in a concrete bunker is not going to make you safe. Being in Jesus is the place you need to be. Amen? According to the Bible, and what we've said today, I wonder, are you doing just the minimum in your walk with God to receive the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Or are you really preparing for the second coming of Jesus? Have you been dressing up for battle like they did in the battle between the Philistines and the Israelites? Dress up twice a day. They put their helmet on, their coat of mail on, their boots on. They got all dressed up and they stood there for battle. And then Goliath shows up and they backed out. They really weren't fighting, but they were dressing up for battle. Preparation, according to the Bible, is for the final crisis, the second coming of Jesus. I don't think there's any prophets among us that can tell us what's coming next, whether we'll be in World War III. I don't know about that. I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. But I do know that if I'm in Jesus, I'm in the place of safety. Amen? According to the Bible, we have to be strong in God. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. If you don't think that's real, I can tell you that it is. I used to be conference evangelist in Southeastern California Conference. About every third set of meetings that I would do, I would run into people that were demon-possessed. A lot of people don't talk about that. I could tell you stories make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It's very real. The Bible says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. My message today is a message of hope. It's a message that God can see you through. In Romans, it talks about us being conquerors, more than conquerors, through his power. It says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today we're talking about being prepared for that event to come. I don't think any of us here know what's coming down the pike next, but I do know what it takes to be prepared. We have to be willing to be used by God. We have to use our talents for God and developing our time, spending that time, drawing closer to him, knowing he's alive and well in our life, developing our talents, and listening to that voice to be guided by God. Let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful victory that was gained by David, this young man that was willing go forward with just a sling against the mountain of flesh called Goliath. Lord, bless us as we step out onto the battlefield that we might prepare to be ready when you call us to go, that you might guide us with your spirit to speak to the person that maybe someone else hasn't spoken to. Lord, use us as we give ourselves to you and we rededicate ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.